All right, thanks everyone. Hopefully you have your ice water, ice coffee, <laughs> chilled beverage of choice. Julie, Abby, thank you for joining me. Um, I think we wanted to start with one question to get a, just take the temperature of the audience. How many people in this room are on boards, any board? Okay. How many people would be interested in applying for one in, say, the next two years? Great. Okay. All right, Abby, let's start with you. Why do you think it's important to have women on, on the board? What's, what's the benefit to the organization? How much time do we have? <laughs> uh, yeah, so, you know, I, I've been working with boards for many, many years, both as an investment banker and then as a recruiter before I started Boardspan. And one of the things you, you really have to ask yourself when you think about boards is what's the purpose of a board? Uh, and hopefully it goes without saying it's to serve the constituents, which the definition of which has changed fairly dramatically over the last 10 years. Uh, but when it comes to the issue of women on boards, if you're trying to serve your constituents best, you have to bring a range of perspectives, right? This, this notion of having a monolithic, sort of single way to approach something is crazy. Um, and so when you think about women on boards, you think about diversity, which brings different perspectives. You think about it from a lot of different angles. You wouldn't have a board with all engineers. Sorry, Bridget. You wouldn't have a board with all accountants. You wouldn't have a board with all of any one type of thing. Um, and so bringing women onto boards, even at the most fundamental level, is the first step in bringing a diverse perspective. Julie, what have you seen in your board experiences? How, what role have you played that's been important? What have you seen from other women you've been on boards with? I think that um, a lot of times I play the role both of sort of area expert in terms of my background and the skills that I bring, but I also bring the perspective of the consumer, um, which is oftentimes, if not often, you know, if not even more often than not, the consumer perspective and lens. And so, um, you know, I think that it's a blend of bringing a different voice to the table um, to just sort of help the conversation go in directions it might not otherwise go, which ultimately I think helps both the service or product that you're creating, but also um, thinks about the employee um, group differently. And so definitely can bring a variety of perspectives. It's, I think, a combination of what skills and experience you bring, as well as sort of the gender perspective. As Monica said before, it's hard to have these kinds of conversations divorced from the, the current um, and almost daily hourly scandals about harassment and inappropriate behavior within the technology industry. Do, do we feel like having more women present in a board context can help with that and, and in what ways? Yeah. Sure, sure. Um, yeah, and I, I, I'm sure Julie will have a lot of insights on this as well. But, you know, um, boards are known to should be setting the tone at the top, right? And the unfortunate thing is we're experiencing an awful lot of tone death at the top right now. Um, and so with the current environment, um, yeah, sitting around that boardroom, trying to uh, celebrate the importance of diversity, to point out to your board colleagues uh, what good behavior looks like, calling them out on bad behavior. You know, when, when David Bonderman made that really, really regrettable comment uh, at the Uber staff meeting, uh, I'm quite sure, I'm, full disclosure, I'm a TPG fan. I've worked with them for many, many years. But I'm quite confident that if he tried that lame joke in front of Ariana Huffington offline, she would have just called him out on it, told him that is, you know, really bad behavior. And he never would have ended up in the predicament he's in. So I think, you know, at the very highest level with the boards, how they talk about things is the first step. Now, not to monopolize this, but I think, I think if I stopped there, I'd be selling the whole point short. It's not just how you talk about things, it's actually how you believe and feel about things. And so we're looking for better behavior. We're looking for people to lead by example. But I think, regrettably, there's still some, um, some more fundamental changes of, do you actually really believe that diversity is good for your organization? And that's a much deeper conversation, a hard one. Yeah, I mean, I think whether you like her or not, Ariana Huffington on the Uber board had an impact. Um, and you know, perhaps it takes someone that um, sort of strong-willed 
um, and outspoken on a board of all men for such a powerful company to be able to change um, or make change. I think if you're putting someone as a token um, and they're clearly not um, welcome and it doesn't actually uh, create an environment where people are interested in the perspective, it doesn't do a lot of good. But I think, um, you know, if you're adding women or diversity in other ways for the right reasons, then you already are primed um, as a the leader of an organization to want to bring that perspective in, and then having it is really excellent because it, it helps in many ways. And one of the things I think we wanted to do today is have a lot of this be practical advice. What are good strategies for women that are, are trying to get on boards um, who want to find opportunities? Julie, could you talk a little bit about how you found your first board opportunities? Yeah. Um, I think so. I've been on four boards, um, and w the way that I originally—I mean, I don't—you can't just say I want to be on a board. Um, it doesn't really work that way. And I think, w as with everything in life, you sort of like have to get the role before you can really get the role. And so it's a hard thing. I remember when my—I was the head of e-commerce and digital for Sephora, and then um, I took over the responsibility also for marketing and my title changed to CMO. And literally the day my title on LinkedIn changed to CMO, I started getting calls for every CMO job and consumer companies and I was like, you know, nothing has changed. Um, but so I think that in order to get on a board, it generally helps to have built some experience. And so for me, you know, I think everyone's path is different. Um, for me, the way that I first got involved was I was, um, a user of you know a variety of software services working at the time I worked for Urban Outfitters, um, and so one of the software companies that I was a customer of asked if I would be on a customer advisory board, and through that I had sort of some exposure to one of their actual board members, and then that board member started calling me for advice on companies he was looking at. He was an investor, um, just because I was a good you know sort of sample um, as they were looking at people in e-commerce, which was my field. And um, then I got to know him, and then he actually asked me to join a board um, that he was an investor in. And after I did that, then I met another investor. Um, ironically, it was Justin Caldback, who um, is a guy that's been in the news a lot um, recently. And he actually introduced me to Katrina uh, Lake, who's the um, founder of Stitch Fix. And so, um, and then I joined that board. Um, and so, you know, I think that it's, um, you know, you sort of work your way up, and I think whether it's a nonprofit or it's a um, a company that is smaller for your first time, I think the question is what is what is your expertise and what do you bring to the table and who could you help the most? Um, and it could be at so many different levels. I think offering to be an advisor to a smaller company is a great way to get your foot in the door, but you need to start somewhere, um, and then you need to build those relationships. And um, one of the things that's been true for me is certainly networking with women is a great opportunity, especially if it's a woman who's getting calls and getting some flow for boards or advisories, and you let her know that you are interested so that if she gets something that she's not interested in, she can pass it on to you. But it's actually been mostly men who have pulled me in to board opportunities because it is really a function of networking. There are certainly recruiters out there, but I think the bar for being called by a recruiter is higher. They're really looking for people who have already done it. Um, and so if you're sort of start trying to start out, um, being able to use your network and use the men that you know as well as the women that you know um, to find those opportunities. Um, then you sort of, you know, you, and you start out really from a place of what can I do to help this company? Um, and that, you know, I think that has to be your initial focus. You're going to get such great experience no matter what, just serving in that role and getting to see another business. And I would say the other point that I would make is when I was sort of in my career, I, um, you know, when I was at Sephora, it wasn't really encouraged to join another board because the perspective was, we really want all your time and focus on your job here. Um, and I knew that the value of being on another board was not only for me personally, developmentally, and for that company to get sort of my perspective, but also it would bring me new perspective that I could bring back to the company. And I, out of that has absolutely been the case. So I think if you manage someone or you're trying to convince or, you know, a manager that you should spend a little time doing this, it's such a good development opportunity both for you and for you to get perspective that you can bring back to your current role. So um, I think it's, it's such a win-win. Abby, how would you advise 
women get their name out there if they're interested. Yeah. Um, you know, I, the first thing I want to do is, is build on Julie's point about working with recruiters. And I know there are a number in the room here. And um, I'm a former recruiter. I ran Russell Reynolds in San Francisco for many, many years. So there's a really valuable role they play. But I, I just think it's really important to people that people know 85% of board seats do not come through intermediaries. OK, 85%. They come through your personal network. Uh, and there's a reason for that. Um, so if you're thinking about you know, just Vegas odds on that one, work your network more than the recruiters. Some of them are, as, as Julie mentioned, um, recruiters have to deliver people that already have some proven board experience. Um, but there are other various other reasons. Um, so back to the practical advice, I always tell people there are three things you ought to do if you want to get on a board. One of them is have a good board profile. It might be your LinkedIn if you've written it the right way, but your LinkedIn may not be helping you if you haven't written it in a way that sort of sends the message about your ability to serve on a board. The second thing is you really have to get your pitch down. Um, you, you got a pretty short elevator ride to take on that one, um, whether it goes in an email, whether it's at a cocktail party, whether you're telling your boss or your own board why they should recommend you. So you want to have your pitch really concise. And the third thing is, is to really use your network smartly um, and to think about not only who can help you, but what's their motivation to help you. Um, we heard a couple messages earlier from Bridget, Selena, and Julie repeated, do not be afraid to ask for help. Uh, if, if you don't ask for help, man, is it a lot harder? So anyway, these things, profile, pitch, network, um, an unapologetic advertising moment is actually all those tools are free on BoardSpan. We are a board software company, but we give a whole bunch of stuff away to individuals because we want to build the board ecosystem. So uh, we even made Gr Bridget be a guinea pig for us. Um, so, you know, and if, if you don't like our tools, do, do it another way, but, but think about those three key elements to getting on a board. When we were talking before this interview, you mentioned some work by a Harvard professor about how um, relationships are often more important than competence. How does that play into these sorts of things of being asked for a board position? And do, how do, do women sometimes make a mistake in focusing more on their competence for the position? Yeah, yeah I'm a, uh, I read a piece by a professor called Amy Cuddy from Harvard. Anybody know Amy's work? Good, yeah, a few people. So she's, she's the famous power pose person, if that sounds familiar, yeah. So um, she wrote, a, she wrote a, piece, a short piece that talked about how to make um, a first impression and what's important. And this piece in particular was a little bit more focused for the newly minted MBAs out of Harvard, but it really applies at all levels. What Amy observed is that there are two things when you're making uh, an impression that are sort of in the framework. One of them is competence, and the other one is trust. Um, and if you think about how important they are, it makes sense. You think about which one's more important. Well, everybody in this room, I'm sure, is competent, right? Um, I imagine everybody in this room is trustworthy, but it's harder to prove you're trustworthy when you're meeting somebody. It's harder to get that across. So the default is show your competence. Um, that was what Amy's work was. And she said it's a huge mistake because at the end of the day, being trustworthy is more important. You know, you want to put somebody on your board. It's got to be somebody you trust. And you hope they're competent or at least competent enough in a specific area, in marketing, in technology, in HR, wherever it is you need them, maybe for the audit committee. But they have to be trustworthy. You don't want somebody on your board who's extremely competent and not so trustworthy. will never fly. So think about those two things. I mean, it's a long conversation about what makes somebody trustworthy. Um, but understanding that is really, really critical. One of the things, um, Abby passed the article to us before this. And one of the things that was in that article that I thought was interesting was uh, one of the ways that you build trust is through warmth. And um, so, and I think another way is sort of that was not in the article, but that I have experienced both myself and through others is um, sort of openness to help. And so I think those are two things that um, are 
great to take advantage of. And when you meet someone and they are so focused on proving their competence, it can almost diminish a sense of trust because there, there's clearly a sense that they're trying to prove themselves. So I thought the article was really interesting because it's kind of this fine balance between um, Yes, obviously, you want your competence to come through, but the trust piece is really sort of a, a whole other angle um, that you know is equally as important. What are, are there other mistakes that, that women tend to make or should avoid, um, Julie, in your mind when, when you're uh, interested in a, a board position? Are there things that, that people do that hurt them or that uh, push them in the wrong direction? Um, I don't know if I have the answer for that. Um, I think that. Um, one of the ways that I think when you're thinking about your building your network and um, being able to ask people for help is just the whole notion of sort of putting the positive energy out there in the first place so that people have a feeling that you are there to help them too. So, I mean, I have helped so many people in their career, many of whom I will never, you know, personally come into contact with again, but I feel like um, the universe really like, you know, recognizes and understands it and the sense of paying it forward has a big impact. So I think any opportunity you have to help someone, you know, will both be a good experience for you to understand sort of what happens in that interaction. Um, and, you know, a lot of times, I mean, I think so much of um, what women are good at is sort of connecting the dots and connecting people. Um, and so as you sort of look for opportunities to help others, I think there will be, um, you know, people out there who, as you have needs or desires or want advice, um, will be willing to help you. Abby, are there mistakes that you think people make? Do, do people sometimes turn down things because they feel like they don't have 100% perfect knowledge of it? Or what, what are sort of the... Yeah, I think um, it's, it's always risky to stereotype by gender or anything what else. Of, what are you doing, I guess, uh, is more the... Yeah, yeah, and I, I do, I, I, picking up on Julie's comment, you know, Women tend, we are socialized to be multitaskers, um, right? And that's a great skill, but that also maybe drives us not necessarily to be perfectionists, but just try to solve all the problems. Um, I, was, I was, the first startup I did many years ago, I was fortunate that our venture capitalist uh, uh, threw everybody in their, all the CEOs of their portfolio companies into a room for one day of communications training. So it was six guys in May, but that was fine. Um, and what this coach pointed out is that when men go to meetings, they bring a little notepad. This is pre-phone days, okay? They bring a little notepad that they keep in their breast pocket, and women go to meetings with like three briefcases so they can have the answer to any question that you might possibly have. That uh, might show competence but not confidence. Um, it's kind of a power move to walk in with just your phone. It's or, a total power right? move, right? And Selena made the comment it. earlier, like the guy who's like, I nailed it. Um, and you know, that's, that doesn't come as naturally to me. Uh, I, I do like revert back to the, um, I know I did that spreadsheet or I can work it out or let me get back to you, which is by the way, a really good thing to say if you don't have the answer, it's okay to say, let me get back to you. But I think that confidence, uh, Jim Davidson, um, who's a, it's, was Silver Lake founder is a, a uh, friend and a personal investor in my company said, Abby, you got to go out there and get over your skis on this thing. It shows confidence to do that. And I think that's what we all need somebody reminding us to lean, uh, lean into it. I guess somebody once wrote a book about that. <laughs> but really... I've um, never heard of it. Yeah, yeah, but just get, you know, it's sort of take those risks. Take smart risks. The other thing is, um, you know, I think uh, if you do, if and when you do join a board, um, there's going to be a lot that you don't know, um, both about the, the business and the company and also about aspects that the board needs to take care of. So sitting on the Redfin board now, um, you know, there's certain things that I can sort of bring my experience to, but there's a lot that I don't know about that I'm learning and I'm so excited to be learning about it. And, you know, it, it, your natural default is to say, you know, why am I, like, do I deserve to be here? I should know all this stuff. I don't know all this stuff, but you got to start somewhere and you got to learn it. And the next, you know, company that goes through an IPO will be, I'll have sort of a different set of experience. But, you know, I think it's, you have to be clear on sort of where you can give and then what you're going to get um, and know that it's a balance always. 
But don't you find sometimes also that it's, there's this, when you stop and ask the question that you think everybody in the room knows, actually, because it's institutional knowledge or whatever, actually there's probably five board members that also haven't been briefed on it, but they don't want to be the one to ask. Yes. Is that okay? I do I think, think that's true. <laughs> no question is usually too stupid. <laughs> There was a recent study showing that uh, men are typically asked to be on boards with far less experience than, than women. Um, people wait until later in a woman's career to ask her. How do, how do we combat that? How do we, because I think that feeds into this whole issue of people feeling like the supply chain isn't there uh, for women board members, when in reality it's just that they, the standard or the, the point of career at which women get asked people wait till later. So how do we, how do we combat that and um, change that to make it clear that there's actually a ton of, of qualified women, even more qualified than some of the men you're asking? Yeah. I, Abby, what do you, when, what do you recommend? Well, you know, back to that confidence issue, I, I think men ask for it. They raise their hands sooner. They're more willing to, to get out over their skis and say, I'd like to get on a board. Um, we, we, joke at, we joke at home, uh, my husband and I, we, I have a 14-year-old son. What we like to say about Lucas is that he's sometimes right, but never in doubt. <laughs> uh, we have a 17-year-old da daughter who was born competent. This kid is really capable, and she has to have had learned how to have her confidence about what she's capable of. Um, you know, I, I don't know if that's, it could be nature, I'd like to think it wasn't nurture, um, but I do think that sometimes it really is about saying, I can do this, I can learn on the job, um, whether I'm willing to ask the, the stupid question, which there is no such thing, right? It's the question that's not asked, that's, that's the wrong one. Um, or uh, just sort of being comfortable in your own skin about that. Um, and I don't know if that's a gender issue, but I think that's what's behind why men are getting picked for boards earlier in their career than women. I think there, I mean, there's also the real factor of when you have kids um, and you're working full time and you can only take on so many things at once, and so it may not be the right time. You know, just at, at the point in your career where you might be ready to think about it, you also have young kids, and there's only only so many hours in the day. Um, but I think that, um, you know, again, back to Cheryl's book, you know, it, there, it, there is a huge benefit in not letting that stop you and knowing that, you know, you can always fit a little bit more in. Um, it has to feel right to you, but if it's the right organization to work with, then it's going to be sort of both natural and you'll figure out a way to work it in. So I, do, I think it takes um, sort of a conscious and active uh, mindset. It also takes having people around you that support you. So whether it's your partner or your friends, you know, we all need cheerleaders um, to remind us that we're awesome and we can do it. So make sure you surround yourself with those people. You know, I'm so glad you said that because I, I wanted to pick up on the support point and, you know, when you were at Sephora and went on your first board, how that was good for you but good for Sephora. Um, you, want your, you want your colleagues at work, whether it's your boss or the people who work for you, to support you and say, oh, uh, Julie's at a board meeting today, so we'll pick up that slack or we'll wait to get the answer to our question. Um, it's, it probably eats in as much to your professional time as it does to your personal time. Um, Glenn's support for Bridget is phenomenal. It, and, and he realizes that it's a win for Redfin. Uh, it's, it's also good for Bridget. But you want to find yourself, you want to, uh, you're not, it's, it's not a, it, you shouldn't be apologizing for the work you do on a board if it takes away from your other time. So that support is really 360. Julie, when you were at Sephora, did, did you telegraph to them at any point, this is something I learned on my, on my board, or here's an idea, that, just to make sure that they understood what kind of the sort of ROI for them was of yeah. giving up your time? I mean, I think it's really useful when you can, I, I was thinking about it when the question, I think someone over here asked about age, and Selena's answer was, well, you have so much more experience. I think the way for my answer to that question is the same for this, which is, 
share your experience. So people at Stitch Fix have said to me, like, we love examples from Sephora or Nordstrom or the places you've been in the past and use it. You know, say, well, you know, Redfin is doing this or, you know, Sephora is doing this. And, and it's helpful because you're actually, you know, when you're working on a business problem to have other data points of what, what companies are doing is incredibly helpful. And so being able to bring that back um, and use it as a data point actually really reinforces that point of how valuable it is. So absolutely. Abby, you talked a little bit before about what sort of materials people should have if they're starting to look at boards, be interested. What, what are the things that people should have prepared and, and in what format? Um, you were saying maybe LinkedIn is right, maybe it isn't. What, what's the, the, uh, what are the things you should have out there? Yeah, so um, just, just to clarify on that, because I didn't mean to suggest that using your LinkedIn isn't helpful. It's really, it's a, let's face it, it's the way we all network professionally, and it's a terrific tool. Uh, I'm just saying that don't think that if you drop the jobs that you've had on your LinkedIn that that would necessarily be sufficient, even with titles, because the reader of that uh, won't necessarily know what, it makes, what about you makes you good for this particular board seat. So if you want to get on a board, take the time to articulate the things that will make you attractive as a board candidate whether it's on your LinkedIn, whether it's on your own personal resume, whether you build a profile at BoardSpan, or get your name in some other databases. Um, there are key things, um, and you know, every company or organization is gonna be a little different, but there are a few key things, and they go back to that point about um, how do you exhibit trustworthiness? How do you exhibit excellent judgment? Um, how do you exhibit leadership? How do you exhibit collaboration? You know, collaboration is critical to boards. So you want to think a little bit about what in your professional background might be ways to highlight that. But you also want to think about in your board pitch. Um, again, you might be give, delivering that pitch verbally. You might be using it in an email. But again, what are you've got your 30 seconds to make that impression. How are you going to create that impression um, in how you tell your own story? Can I actually ask like a, a mechanical question? When you talk about a board pitch, is that something that someone is interested in you being on the board, they would solicit from you? Are you going out proactively because you know there's an opportunity? At what stage and how does that wind up getting delivered? <laughs> yeah, it, it really depends upon the circumstance, but back to my 85% st you know, statistic, which is if you're reaching out to people um, to say, hey, I think I'm at that point in my career where I'm ready to go on a board. I'd like to give back. First of all, why do you want to go on a board? Please, go think about it, okay? And don't say, because um, I read you can make a lot of money. It may be true, but don't tell them that. Um, but think about why you want to go on a board uh, and make it specific about you. Don't come up with a generic answer. Um, and then when you reach out to people, I would start off by making sure you do get the support uh, from the right person in your organization that person may have some great ideas or lead you to other great ideas and people you can talk to. Um, so you want that kind of support there. But then you're reaching out to your network or somebody else's network that they're happy to lend to you. That's where the pitch comes in, which is the, I'm at the point in my career uh, where I think I'm ready for a board. This is why. Um, and that's your pitch. So, Julie, you may have some thoughts. I mean, I, it's interesting because for me, it's more been more about in the early days, the specific company, um, and so I think there's been an added element of not just what can I bring and why am I interested, but why am I interested in the specific company. Um, so I think it depends on how, if it's an advisory role to start or if it's more they have an actual board seat that they're trying to fill. Um, so it's a little bit adaptive, but obviously. You know, being a consumer of that business in whatever way, shape, or form, knowing everything you can know about that company and having a sense of what you, sort of knowing if you can, who already is on the board and what the composition of the management team is so that you can sort of, you know, make the case of what you could bring to that organization, I think is also really useful. But Julie, you've been considered for several large board seats. What, what was that process like? What did you learn from it? Yeah, I was telling these guys on the phone before we did this that um, I was down to, it was down to me and one other woman for three big public boards, and three times I lost the spot. So um, it was definitely a really interesting process and a, and a learning process. And so I think with each board, um, it was done a little bit differently, and, um, and you, but 
that experience was really useful to me because I learned so much from being interviewed by all these board members just about how different boards work and sort of the profiles of different people and the kinds of things that they're looking for um, and how to present myself and how much they, I mean, in different boards they were looking for, so two of them were the large CPG companies. Um, and, you know, I think part of it for them is also figuring out what they want. So in each case, um, they chose someone, they were sort of thinking they wanted a woman and they wanted sort of digital experience, um, and they wanted, so boards are especially, public boards are larger, you know, later stage boards, tend to strategically think about filling their board with different areas of expertise, which is the way you should do it as a, as a business, um, but also different perspectives, and so um, they, in, in the case of the, the spots that I was being considered for, they had established that they wanted a woman and they wanted someone who had digital experience, but then, you know, that's pretty generic. And so they think we're trying to figure out what they wanted and over time, in two of the cases, they specifically figure out, figured out they wanted someone with investment experience. Um, and so that is not my background and not what I brought to the table. Um, and so, you know, I think it was a great chance to meet members of the boards, um, most of the members of the boards that I was interviewing with were on many boards, so most of them were older and they were retired for the most part, which it made me realize they needed to add some people who were sort of in operating roles because it's a really different mindset. Um, and they, you know, like most of them, you know, talk, um, were Clorox and um, Kimberly Clark, they were on the board because they knew someone else who was on the board and that person had sat on another board with them. And so, I mean, it's an incredibly small and connected world. And so, you know, I really do see a sea change in this awareness and desire to bring younger and more diverse members onto boards, whereas it wasn't, it do, doesn't appear to have been a priority when I look at the boards of these larger companies. And so usually there's one or two women and they're very senior um, and so, you know, it's taught me a lot just about sort of the dynamics of boards and what to expect. And um, even thinking and sort of building my profile, my thought was, you know, joining a large public company board when I haven't been on a public company, I've only been on private company boards, is probably the not the way I'm going to get there. And so when I met Glenn and was talking about Redfin, they were a private company who was thinking at some point in the future they would go public. And I thought, you know, I. I, that's a great experience and it will be a great way to transition from a private to public board. Um, the other thing that I must say that's a little bit um, sort of tangential but critical I think as you think about a board is especially for a smaller company, so much of the success of your experience on a board ties to the CEO. And so it's really an advisory group for the CEO and the management team, but primarily your relationship is with the CEO. And so of the boards that I sat on, I would say two of them, the CEO was not particularly interested in the opinions of the board. It was more kind of rubber stamping or getting the funding support to do the next things they needed to do. And two of them, they were really interested and really engaged. And those relationships were so much more fruitful and my ability to um, contribute meaningfully made a huge difference too. So I think that um, you know, as you think about the experience and where you might be able to be sort of most useful, really get putting the investment in and focusing in on who is the CEO and what does he or she need um, and, and connecting the dots that way is going to make all the difference on how effective you feel and how successful that experience is. Um, why don't we take some audience questions if we have a one right. Okay. We decided that I'm doing the front of the room and other people are doing the back of the room, so we're going to do this a little bit easier. There you go. Uh, thank you. Uh, you've both spoken a little about asking for help. My question is, how do you ask for help in a way that doesn't feel like you're just taking rather than giving? So, like, you're asking for help, you don't really know what you can give to the relationship yet. How do you help make yourself feel better about that or some strategies on how to do that? My experience being asked for help is that um, it is better if it's something that's sort of built over time or very specific. So if someone who, I mean, it is amazing what a difference it makes if there is a 
shared connection. So if someone is coming to me saying, you know, a friend of mine or someone I know is saying, would you help this person? I'm, you know, 10 times more likely to respond to the email or, you know, t talk to someone at a conference or whatever if there's some connection. So I would say definitely if you can get a personal introduction to someone who you want to help you. Um, and I would say the second thing is, um, you know, sort of build a little rapport before you go into asking for help and give a little context of what you're looking for and make the ask specific. You know, if you, if you can help someone fairly quickly or effectively by giving someone a name or one or two suggestions or, um, you know, sort of say, send me an email and I'll connect you to this person and then following up, um, you know, I think everyone has good intent, but if it's not specific, it's going to be very hard for the person to help. Um, so I don't think it's so much that you need to give you know, someone help back. I think you just need to both first make sure that there's a connection and there's an appeal, and then second, to be as specific as you can and how you can ask for help. And I'm going to come at your question slightly differently, um, which is to say the fact that you asked that question is awesome. <laughs> because it shows that you're thinking about things are two ways. And the answer may be you can't help them, or at least right now. Um, but you don't know. And so if, if at the right time, per Julie's, Julie's advice, you, you, you know, go and ask for help, what you say to somebody is, is you know, first of all, show them appreciation. Mm -hmm. And then you say, can I help you with anything? Or if I can help you in the future. Uh, one of the core aspects of recruiting, whether it's boards or at any other level, is to do references, a whole separate conversation. But every single time I do a reference, I always tell people, you can call me in the future if I can help you with something. Uh, returning that favor, making it mutual, you are onto the right track when you ask that question. So well done, you. I also think um, for sort of you know, younger people asking older people for help, we all need to hire all the time, and we're always looking for talent So at all levels. And so anytime I meet anyone, I think, you know, Maybe they'll have some friends who could join my team or whatever it is. So there's a lot, you know, I think help can come in lots of forms. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're gonna do this person and then Robin will do your person, okay? Sorry. Hi, uh, thank you. My name's Dana Good. Um, I work at Aortica in Bellevue. Um, my question has to do with the composition of boards. I've stuck with the technical track my entire career, so I'm a principal at this point. And the question I have is, is it necessary to be an executive level person to go to a board, or do they also need the kind of technical experience that someone who has been on that track for a long time would have, or is it just, do they not mix at all? <coughs> I just don't have a feeling for that. Do you want me to take that? Yeah, um, you know, it's, um, th there's no blanket answer, and it depends upon the nature of the board. So, you know, one of, the, one of the things that very few people realize is there are 400,000 boards, operating boards in the United States, right? So if you're asking that question about going on a Fortune 500 public board, it may be an impediment, quite candidly. Um, they're looking for people. One of the most common things that a CEO uh, or other board members look for are people that have walked in these shoes before. Um, and it may not be the exact same shoes, but they've done something similar enough. However, there are so many different types of boards and ways to help. There are subsidiary boards, there are uh, industry boards, there are private company advisory boards that Julie talked about earlier. So yeah, if you've come up a technical uh, path, it doesn't mean you can't be on a board. It's about being on a board where your talents are particularly valuable, and it is about getting that fit. It's a puzzle. I'm Yasmin Mehdi, and I'm here representing Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal. Um, and I'm curious what role you feel you as board members have to play in advocating for women and diversity in the companies whose boards you serve on. Um, I think the role is both formal and informal. So I think there are uh, discussions that happen, and this is more from what I've seen than just my own personal experience, but um, you know, there's talking about the approach to comp and making sure, I mean, you could see from um, sort of Redfin, they do this very proactively, but many companies don't 
step back and look at pay by gender and ethnicity. So I think it's sort of establishing some expectations and standards for the management team and talking about it, asking the questions, and if it's not there, setting it up. Um, I think it's doing things like um, events for the employees, for women in the company to get exposure to the women on the boards and learn from their experience. Um, I think it's offering to um, be thought partner and advisor to the women members of the management team, as well as the men, frankly. Um, so those are some of the things that come to mind. I think that for sure, um, you know, when you're thinking about some of the formal <coughs> responsibilities of a board, so whether it's compensation, whether it's bringing on new board members or new management team members, making sure that that's part of the discussion so that that's a key part of the consideration for new membership, um, you know, is a huge one. Okay, we're gonna do this question and then we'll get to you next, okay? Hi, um, so I'm gonna ask a question kind of just from uh, a different perspective. I'm, uh, I, I run the operations in a startup in the title insurance space, which is not a very sexy space, but we're yes, trying. It is. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> um, so I get to present to the board every month, and this is kind of new and exciting for me, and so I kind of barrel into the meeting and say all these things and, and wonder if that's what they want to hear. So from your experience being on a board in a startup, you know, in the first year, what do you want to hear from the humans that are, like I'm essentially designing and building the machine to connect to the technology, which is incredibly detailed. So I'm trying to, you know, put it in as most attractive terms as possible, but what does a board member want to hear about that kind of stuff? You know, I think it's a, it's a major generalization to answer that question, but I'll go ahead and try and do it, which is I think they want to hear the truth, um, what's working and what's not, um, and what you're learning from what's not working and what you're going to try next. So I think putting a, you know, purely sunny view of something that's probably not purely sunny is not great. Um, but I think having clarity around what you've tried um, and being able to summarize it in an efficient way so that there can be enough depth of understanding so there can be meaningful sort of digestion and questions around it, but um, having it not be so detailed that you're pulling them into things that are, you know, sort of it's too deep. And so I think it's getting it at the right level to discuss it and um, being honest about what you're learning from doing it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you, uh, as quickly as I can, a framework that I use with board clients all the time to address that very specific issue. Think about an x-axis that has uh, the board's job. Just, you know, we're not going to articulate what it is, but the board's job goes along your x-axis. Management's job goes along the y-axis. axis, And draw, um, draw a straight line, you know, up and to the right. There's stuff that's the board's job that goes below that diagonal line, and there's stuff that's management's job that goes above it. You can move that line. You know, if, if you get your board really th th thinking strategically and long-term and super generative, then there's stuff that the board really doesn't want to know about, you know, how to hire or fire or whatever. But you may be a little bit more in a crisis or just like really tactical mode, and you need the board's help, and that's why they're there. So you push them to the upper side of that line. I think the key thing is, is knowing if everybody, where everybody wants to be on that line. Um, because you may find times also where the board's getting into too much detail and you don't need their help and they're micromanaging. It's been known to happen. I think if you set the, the goals for the relationship that management has with the board and then you check in, are we on the right side of the line? Has this worked for you? Has it worked for us? That's the dialogue, and it's, it's Julie's very first point, which is the truth, right? But also, I think to your point, understanding why they're interested in the information and making sure that it's the right, you know, that being very clear what the goal out of presenting it to the board is for you and for the board. Okay, we're going to take two more questions just to try to stay on time. We've got one here and then one back there. Hi, so um, how do you access the 400,000 board opportunities and is there an app for that? <laughs> We're working on it. Or is it just LinkedIn <laughs> or networking? Uh, yeah, so uh, 400,000 boards, they don't all have board opportunities at any given time, but 
you know, th there is no formal way that I know of, and that's why it really is through your network. Um, you know, I, and, and it's not that boards post all the time. Some do, some do. Um, but I think it is a lot about just getting in the flow. One of the comments Julie made earlier, which is, as you build out your network, there are plenty of people that get lots of calls, that hear about the opportunities. They sometimes get calls that are, we know you're too busy, Julie, but who could you recommend? They're not even gonna ask her, because they know it's not gonna suit her, her schedule right now. Um, and that's why you wanna get in, in the flow with those those groups. Um, there are organized groups that actually do really good work around this. WCD is one, for example. Um, some of them, um, it's a little bit of a Groucho Marx club in some case, right? You can't get in if you're not already in. But, but there are ways to, to break through those barriers. And I do think that, per the earlier comments that were made, is that that is changing. It feels glacially, painfully slow, but it is changing. And I actually think technology is one of the best ways to change it. Hello. Oh my God. <laughs> Thanks for being here. We, um, you talked about being on a board because it's helpful, like pick a board that's helpful that you can help with. But I'm missing a synthesis of why boards are important. Um, so I'd just love to hear. You guys are committed. I just yeah, I want a I little more. I was wondering. I felt you. like that was sort of skipped. Um, yeah, I mean, there's, I think there's an assumption that everybody is interested in them and, you know. Um, so, for me, um, the reason is, first and foremost, just sort of intellectual curiosity and ability to learn from other companies so that I can both, um, I would say, know more about the world, but also then learn that in ways that I can apply back to my business. Um, so that's the primary reason. I do think that it's, it's fun to, um, it's a great way to sort of meet new people um, and learn from them. So I sit on our board and I marvel at the expertise of some of the other people in the room um, because they're so knowledgeable and they've built such a um, experience set in a certain area, generally in finance. Um, and so it's so additive to your perspective on the world and your business to be able to learn from others. So I think that's the primary reason. Um, for me, it's sort of the combination of, of learning out of interest and learning so that I can sort of apply it back. I also really enjoy the feeling of being able to help. So also that is, you know, that's always felt critical to me is where can I help add value to because it's just a satisfying feeling. Did that, did that answer? Okay. Okay. Can we get a round of applause for these ladies? Thank you.